scientists who are working in other disciplines to the field of HIV research. This initiative will foster cross-disciplinary research, promote novel ideas, and aid in the success of investigators at an early career stage. Researchers who are not actively engaged in HIV AIDS research and have never been involved in AIDS uh, as part of their career qualify for this program. Following a competitive and rigorous application process, 10 outstanding early stage researchers from a wide range of disciplines are awarded research grants totaling uh, to 3.4 million USA uh, to um, pursue groundbreaking research in the field. Research projects will be supported in collaboration with a CIFAR institution with expertise in the candidate's area of research. The grants are awarded, um, and we are going to show you the pictures of the awardees, to Joseph Brown, a lecturer at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine for the Project Environmental Health and HIV AIDS in rural South Africa, working with Charlie Vanderhorst at the UNC Chapel Hill, Dennis Evans, uh, medical doctor, clinical HIV research unit uh, uh, in medicine uh, at the University of Witterwestern, uh, Johannesburg, for the project Low Cost Monitoring of HIV in Resource Limited Settings, working with Christopher Matthews from UCSD, CIFAR Clinical Corps, Director USC uh, for our, the Owen Clinic. Uh, Kelly Lee, Assistant Professor, University of Washington for a project entitled Revolving, Resolving uh, the Core Protein Skeleton of the HIV Envelope gly Glycoprotein Spike, working with Hugh Luke Hugh and the University of Washington at the Washington National Primate Research Center. Uh, Justin Mentorn, uh, Career Development Award Fellow at, Walt at the Walter and Lisa Hall Institute of Medical Research in Melbourne for the project Combating HIV Virus Infection with BST2, working with Bali Pulendran at Emory University. Also, Bradley Nilsson, Assistant Professor of Chemistry at the University of Rochester for the project Probing the Structure and Function of Semen Enhancer of HIV Infection, working with Stephen Dehurst at the University of Rochester, uh, Clovis Palmer, a postdoctoral fellow at Burnett Institute, Melbourne, Australia, for the project Novel Approaches to Study T-Cell uh, Metabolic Dysfunction and Immune Response During HIV Infection, working with Joseph uh, McCune at UCSF, and Manu Platt, Assistant Professor, Georgia Institute of Technology for the project Cardiovascular Disease and HIV Vascular Biomechanics and Remodeling, working with Roy Sutliff at Emory University. Isabel Sada Oval, a medical researcher, Instituto Nacional de Enfermedades Respiratorias, uh, Mexico City, for a project, a novel pathway to induce killing of mycobacterium tuberculosis in HIV patients, working with Marilyn Marchina Aro from Ragon Institute of M MGH, MAT, and Harvard. Amit Singh, uh, DBT Welcome Intermediate Fellow from the International Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology in New Delhi, for the project Measuring Intracellular Redox Potential of HIV-1 Infected Macrophages, working with Dr. Rafi Ahmed, Emory Vaccine Center uh, at the Joint Vaccine Center in New Delhi. And King Woodward, Assistant Professor at the University of Washington for the project Multifunctional Nanoparticles as a Combination Microbicide to Prevent Mucosal Transmission of HIV, working with uh, uh, McClurth, Florian Hladek, Patrick Taito, at the University of Washington, Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center, CIFAR. May I ask the awardees to stand up and face the audience so we can acknowledge them? Thank you very much, and we'll move on now to the uh, uh, plenary session. Thanks.
Good morning. My name is Christopher Kennedy Lawford, and I'm here today as an example of what is possible when access to treatment, care, and drugs is available to those living with drug addiction and hepatitis C. And as an advocate for the close to 200 million people worldwide with HCV who are neglected and underserved. I'm here to introduce Dimitro Sharembe. Dimitro Sharembe is director of the Department of Communications, Policy, and Advocacy at the All Ukrainian Network of PLHA. Mr. Sharembe has been HIV positive for 14 years and was incarcerated from 1992 to 2001. While in prison, he studied philosophy and taught himself English. In 2005, he was elected to the Coordination Council of the All-Ukrainian Network of PLWH, became deputy chair, and has represented the network's interests on regional, national, and international levels ever since. Our second speaker, Manfred Nowak. Manfred Nowak is Professor of International Human Rights Protection at University of Vienna and Director of the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute of Human Rights. He received the UNESCO Prize for the Teaching of Human Rights and was head of the European Master's Degree in Human Rights and Democratization. In Venice from 2000 to 2007, he has performed a range of different tasks for the United Nations, including service as the UN Special Rapporteur on torture since December 2004. Good morning, everybody. Я хочу рассказать маленькую историю, которая очень красочно характеризует большую эпидемию в моей стране. I want to tell you a small story which characterizes a big epidemic in my country. 200 тысяч человек в Украине, которые находятся в тюрьмах, полностью не защищены от эпидемии вид спида. 200,000 people are locked in Ukrainian prisons with no protection from HIV, TB, and hepatitis. Я был в тюрьме 9 лет без права на защиту жизни. Nine years in prisons with no right for life protection. Люди в закрытом помещении, в котором набито больше 40 человек, без свежего воздуха, без проветривания камер, дым сигарет, влага на стенах. Со временем все привыкали к таким существованию, которые по сути несовместимо были из жизни. Forty persons in closed premises without fresh air and ventilation, cigarette smoke and damp walls getting used to existence under condition, conditions not fit for life. Все наркозависимые люди, которые попадают в тюрьму, автоматически не освобождаются от своей зависимости. Наверное, только существует ограниченный доступ. Но поверьте мне, мы всегда находили возможность приобрести наркотики и в тюрьме. No imprisoned drug addict was automatically free from substance dependence. Only the excess was limited, but we always managed to find a way to get drugs. Когда мы его приобретали, самым большим дефицитом в камере, конечно же, был шприц, и приходилось употреблять его одним шприцом все вместе. When we bought them, we would shoot it from one syringe, as they were extremely hard to get. Иголки использовали так много раз, что со временем они стирались. Их приходилось натачивать, их приходилось хранить. Больше дефицита, чем игла, которую употребляли наркозависимые в тюрьме, не было. One can't even imagine the ways and things we would inject drugs with. Syringes were made out of pens and pen refills. The needles would be used so many times, they would get dull, so there would be only one way out to use it longer, to sharpen them with stone again and again, until nothing is left. Тюрьма не является лекарством от наркозависимости. 
И я хотел бы сказать всем, что людей, которые больны, необходимо лечить лекарствами. Их не надо лечить дубинками, их не надо лечить камерами, их не надо лечить унижением. На самом деле все эти вещи не являются лекарствами в мире. Prison is no treatment for, from drug addiction, and I would like to tell everyone that addiction must be treated using medical approaches, but not with punishment, humiliation and violence. Попав в тюрьму, и особенно в такие условия, в которых я находился, вы не имеете элементарных средств защиты от гепатита, туберкулеза, ведь спида. И со временем, конечно же, складывается впечатление, что это целенаправленно сделано ради того, чтобы такие люди, которые туда попадают, не выживали. Почему я это говорю? Потому что на самом деле мне тяжело объяснить, что одни люди, других людей абсолютно сознательно содержат в таких нечеловеческих условиях. I find it hard to explain why some people intentionally keep other people in such dire conditions for many years. В заключение, конечно же, все делают татуировки. Ну, дань моде, либо просто заполнить время. Тогда нас на самом деле никого не беспокоило, что эти люди, что инструментарий мы никаким образом не могли дезинфицировать. In jail, everybody has tattoos made. Whether of boredom or fashion doesn't matter now. Everyone uses the same instrument. We were not concerned with the lack of disinfectants for a needle that we made tattoos with. We just didn't have the possibility. И даже самое элементарное, такие средства гигиены, как бритвенный станок, мы использовали все вместе один. Это было связано с простым дефицитом и отсутствием возможности иметь каждому бритвенный станок. Это следующее предложение. Even the most elementary things like razors were used in turn. Конечно же, секс, простой, никто не отменял в тюрьме. Только вот средства защиты не предусмотрели. Просто смотрители, которые решили, что они наркозависимость вылечат тюрьмой, они почему-то решили, что они и тюрьмой искоренят секс. Certainly, no one abandoned sex in prisons, but no one provided any protection. Simply the guards who decided they can treat drug addiction with imprisonment could also eradicate sex by a prison system. При всей очевидной глупости и безумности подхода к содержанию людей в тюрьме в 21 веке, сегодня в Украине ситуация не изменилась. И люди сегодня, прямо сейчас, когда мы находимся в зале, находятся в таких нечеловеческих условиях. Despite obvious foolishness and thoughtlessness of this approach to incarceration, situation in Ukraine hasn't changed. Мой друг умер в 21 год, не дожив до свободы три месяца. И до самого последнего момента он не понимал на самом деле, почему он умирает. И только после смерти мы все узнали о том, что он умер от ВИЧ. A friend of mine died at the age of 21, three months short of release. Only after his death we learned that he was HIV infected. He didn't know about it himself and didn't understand why he was dying. Его жизнь – это одна из тысяч судеб, заключенных в Украине которая характеризует всю ту ситуацию, в которой находятся люди. Но по сути для нас, для всей украинской сети людей, живущих с ВИЧ-спидом, это преступление против людей. Когда тебя лишают свободы в Украине, наверное, в других странах, автоматически лишают всего. Диагностики, лечение, понимание, уважение. В результате простых вещей, которые тебе необходимы для того, чтобы выжить, ты получаешь голод и нечеловеческие условия содержания. 
you are automatically deprived of everything – treatment, care, diagnostics, prevention, education and respect. Instead, you are provided with horrible living conditions and constant hunger. В таких условиях содержания я пробыл 9 лет. 9 лет пробыл лишь только за то, что я был человеком, который употребляет наркотики. These are the conditions that the prisoners in Ukraine are held in. Conditions I lived in for 9 years for being a drug user. Я потерял очень много друзей. Они умерли от передозировки, они умерли от гепатита, туберкулеза, от ВИЧ-спида. I lost many friends. They didn't survive. Overdose, HIV, tuberculosis, hepatitis became a reason for death in prisons. Когда я освободился, мне поставили все три диагноза. ВИЧ, туберкулез, гепатит. И врач, с которым я общался, он мне прямо в глаза и сказал... Шансов у тебя никаких нет. I was diagnosed with all three immediately after release. TB, HIV, hepatitis. Only then the doctor told me at the time, there is no chance. Я выжил. Я получил образование. У меня двое детей. Хорошая семья, любимая работа. I survived. I received education. Got married. We have two wonderful children, hundreds, hundreds of friends, and favorite job. Но но самое страшное, что моя судьба это исключение из правил. But the most terrible thing is that it is an exception. Я выжил не потому, что мне помогали, а вопреки. Не потому, что мне пытались каким-то образом спасти мою жизнь, а потому, что я боролся. I survived despite all, not because someone wanted to help me. I survived because I fought, but I wasn't receiving any help. Я хотел доказать, что мы люди, которые достойны понимания, уважения и хорошего будущего. I wanted to prove that we are humans who have a right for life, respect, understanding, a right for health and protection. И я считаю, что люди в заключении имеют право на жизнь и на все средства защиты от, этих, от тех эпидемий, которые сегодня существуют в мире. People in prisons have a right for all preventive measures. They have a right for diagnostics, treatment, care and support. Они имеют право на диагностику, лечение, уход и поддержку. Имеют право на жизнь, квалифицированную медицинскую помощь. И должны быть защищены. They have a right for life, qualified medical help, and must be protected from HIV/AIDS epidemic in prison. Они имеют право, потому что они люди. They have the right because they are human. Thank you very much. Good morning. First, I would like to thank the International AIDS Society, not only for the human rights approach to this conference, but also for devoting a plenary for the first time to incarceration, prisons and detention. It's a very important issue and has been forgotten often. I also would like to thank my co-authors, Ralf Jürgens, uh, Marcus Day, Roland Schmidt and many others uh, who helped both for the paper accompanying this presentation and also the presentation itself. Unfortunately, the story we just heard of Dima and the situation in the Ukraine is not unique at all. It is similar in most countries of the world. As United Nations Special Rapporteur on Torture and other forms of cruel, inhuman and degrading treatment or punishment, uh, I am visiting many countries in the world and I not only look at torture, 
because this takes place behind closed doors, I spend most of my time in prisons, remand centers, police custody, psychiatric institutions, and many other places of detention. And after six years in this function, my conclusions are alarming. There is a global prison crisis. I found torture, with the only exception of Denmark and Greenland, in all countries I visited, often in a routine way, widespread, sometimes even systematic, as in Equatorial Guinea and Nepal. But what was much more alarming is that many of the Titanese whom I interviewed in private told me it's terribly to be tortured at the beginning, the first days in police custody, in order to extract a confession or information, but it is nothing compared to the many years of continuing deprivation of any human rights in detention facilities around the world. And my findings of a global prison crisis are supported by statistical evidence. For instance, the world prison population uh, reports by King's College in London shows already on the one hand that there's a high discrepancy of the prison population per country in relation to 100,000 inhabitants, the United States um, with 756 on the one hand, Russia the second, uh, certain countries in the Caribbean, in southern Africa, in general the post-Soviet countries uh, on the lead, but then on the other side having countries with a very low rate, clearly below the average, particularly in West Africa, such as Burkina Faso and others in uh, Western and Northern Europe, but also countries like India or Nepal. The average is about 145. There are around 10 million persons in prisons every day, but at the same time there are about 30 million persons who enter and leave prisons uh, per year, and that means also, if they are infected with HIV uh, during their prison stay, it becomes a public health problem. About 60% of all countries have more prisoners than their prisons provide capacity for. That means overcrowding, and this is a national average. It means that in many prisons, it's double or three times as many. And we have countries in particular in Africa, also Latin America, Benin, Bangladesh, and others that have even three times the capacity. That means three prisoners have to fight for one place to sleep or have to share the beds or mattresses or at least the space on the concrete floor. What are the reasons for the overcrowding? There are many reasons. Um, of course, uh, there are many too, too many people in prison because of uh, criminalization of certain behavior, very often it's drug use uh, in many countries like the United States, uh, but others, uh, a very high percentage of prisoners are actually convicted of drug-related offenses or other uh, similar offenses. Secondly, and most importantly, is that the criminal justice system is not functioning. And the best indicator is the percentage of pretrial detention in relation to all detainees. And if you have countries like Liberia with 97% or Mali with almost 90%, uh, it means the administration of justice is not functioning. I would say in general, whenever there's a country where more than 40% of the detainees are in pretrial detention, then something is wrong. Uh, the criminal justice system is uh, corrupt, too slow, etc. Just to give you one example, Nigeria, and there are quite a number of countries that have more than 60%. In Nigeria, I agreed at the end with President Obasanjo uh, that there were between 20 and 25,000 individuals who would have to be immediately released, and many of them have been released. Why? Because they have spent more time in pretrial detention than the maximum sentence was which they could receive in case they would be sentenced. And that is similar in, in many, many countries, also those recently visited, like Papua New Guinea. 
These are a few uh, images. Uh, what does it mean to have uh, overcrowding, lack of bedding? This is in Malawi. Um, these are the left is the remand detention facility in Colombo in Sri Lanka or Hanuman Doka police station, the main police station in, in Kathmandu. But just, those are just a few examples. You will find the same in most countries of the world. This is the infamous Libertad prison uh, in Uruguay, Las Latas, uh, which were only built um, in uh, 2003. Uh, but they're totally run down. They were built for one person per cell. Now there are at least three persons in there. They have, and you see it a little bit, they have to stand in shifts in order to get enough air because uh, everything is broken down, the sewage system, the water, etc. They have to uh, use plastic bags for defecation and plastic bottles they receive uh, for urinating it and throwing it out, the smell and uh, um, the noise is, is, uh, is just unbearable even for prison stuff. This is the so-called torture room in the main police station in Lagos in Nigeria, about 120 people, including children, including women, uh, together for many weeks, uh, many of them heavily tortured. Um, the lack of sanitary facilities, these are recent photos from Mount Hagen police station in the highlands of Papua New Guinea. Uh, again, you see there the plastic bottles used and the plastic bags, uh, similar in Equatorial Guinea, in Jamaica, in, uh, in many countries that I visited. In general, we can say that HIV prevalence is much higher in prisons uh, than uh, in the general population, although it's very difficult to have reliable figures. But many scientific studies have been carried out to show, for instance, to start with the Ukraine, um, that the prevalence in prison is at least 10 times, if not more, that of the overall population. Russia, of course, in countries like South Africa, where you have a high rate in general, but even we have a study where up to 41 percent uh, of the detainees were HIV positive in Latin America, Brazil, Argentina. In Indonesia, there are certain studies that it might even be uh, a hundred times uh, as much, and the same we find also in relation to tuberculosis and hepatitis. Um, what is the main reason? Of course, like outside, using non-sterile drug injection equipment, and of course it depends also on the countries. That is the main reason in Eastern Europe, uh, Southeast Asia, and other, other areas, but of course sexual contacts, whether they are consensual or non-consensual in prison settings, you can't often distinguish. There are other factors such as tattooing, sharing of razors, piercing, etc. Now, what is it that we have to do to effectively prevent HIV transmissions in prisons? Science tells us exactly what we have to do. It's just a question of political will to implement it. As Tima has said, if you are imprisoned, you are deprived of your human right to personal liberty, but you should enjoy all the other human rights on an equal footing with others. In reality, you're deprived of all human rights, access to food, access to water, access to health care, access to privacy, uh, etc. That is the reality. You are there without any kind of human rights uh, and, and liberties. What should be done is similar to outside prison, information, education. Whenever you come into a prison, you should be informed about the, the risk of HIV transmission. Uh, you should. Uh, be subjected to HIV testing and counseling, but of course on the basis of the three C's, uh, free and informed consent um, and confidentiality and of course counseling. If you are HIV positive, you should have the same right to treatment like anybody else has. You should not be segregated. Condoms should be provided. As again Dima has said, uh, there is no prison without sex, but there's also no prison without drugs. So the easiest is to provide condoms free of charge, anonymously, um, and of course prison authorities have an obligation to prevent rape, sexual violence, and other forms of coercion. Needle and syringe programs are very, very effective 
but only used in 11 countries. The first one was Switzerland in 1992. Moldova is another recent example, Spain and others, but primarily in Europe and uh, uh, Central Asia. Bleach programs are only a second alternative if NSPs are not available. But of course, very important is any form of uh, opioid substitution therapy, methadone and other drug dependence treatments, which we have in about 40 countries, in particular North America, Australia, Europe, but also countries like Iran or Indonesia have started to implement it. And as I have said, one of the most important measures to prevent HIV transmission would be the reduction of overcrowding. Uh, of course, overcrowding leads to violence, uh, it leads to uh, uh, conditions that are conducive to transmission of uh, HIV and other similar diseases. One best example, best practice example is Spain. Uh, in 1988, about 50% of the prisoners in Madrid were HIV positive. At that time, for instance, also in New York, about 20%. Uh, and then there were various methods introduced, from condom distribution to needle and syringe programs already in 1997, and you see here the number of needles and also prisons participating, also needles that have been distributed. You also have at the same time a methadone maintenance program, and you see the number of prisoners who benefited from this program. And if you compare that to the reduction of HIV prevalence in Spanish prisons from 32% in 1989 to 7% in 2009. That is clear evidence that these HIV uh, prevention methods are working. And what is always used as an argument that they might be dangerous, they encourage to more drug use, has not been verified by scientific studies. Also needles are not used in order as a, as a weapon, etc. So they are functioning and effective methods. As I have said, if you are HIV positive, you are entitled as everybody else to uh, antiretroviral therapy uh, and other forms of treatment, care and support. As we know already outside prisons, there are millions of human beings who have no access to this kind of treatment. In prisons, it's a very, very small minority. One of my main um, recommendations to all countries in the world is move the responsibility for the prison health system from the Ministry of Justice or Interior or Security to the Ministry of Health would be very, very important. In general, health services in prisons throughout the world are appalling. And of course, special attention should be uh, given to female prisoners. They have specific needs. Also, they are in danger of being raped by male prison guards and, and others. Uh, and they have certain needs. And of course, uh, juveniles and children in detention. I'm coming to the conclusions. Uh, the most important one is evidence-based intervention needs to be implemented uh, so versus moralism. Every form of uh, criminalization of sex and drugs, uh, compulsory testing, etc., uh, has proven to be counterproductive. As I said, prison health is public health. If there are 30 million people entering and leaving prisons and have a much higher risk of HIV transmission in prisons, then it is a public health system and should be taken seriously. Prevention is better than cure. Provide methadone, provide needles and syringe programs, uh, and provide condoms. Of course, prisoners with HIV or AIDS have the same human right to medical care treatment and support. And finally, but certainly not least importantly, an urgent need for a comprehensive criminal justice and prison reform means decreasing the number, not building more prisons, decreasing the number of prisoners. There are far too many persons in detention because of non-useful criminalization, but in particular non-functioning of criminal justice systems, in particular reducing pretrial detention, using non-custodial measures, fighting corruption, and providing more funds for a well-functioning criminal justice system 
in all countries of the world. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Eli Katavira from Kampala, Uganda, and I have the honor to introduce our next speaker, who is going to talk about care and support integral to comprehensive care. She's Liz Guaya, who is the CEO of the Hospice Palliative Care Association of South Africa, and she's also a senior lecturer in the University of Cape Town, where she heads the palliative care unit within the School of Public Health and Family Medicine. She received her medical degree from the University of Cape Town in 1979 and has worked as a general practitioner in Zimbabwe and South Africa until 1993. She began working in hospice care on a voluntary basis in 1993 and obtained her master's in science in, public, in palliative medicine from the University of Wales College of Medicine in Cardiff in 2003. Liz. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank the International Aid Society and conference organizers for the invitation to speak on the topic of care and support and my co-authors, Bongai Mundeta from VSO Racer, Derek Lohman from Human Rights Watch, Shannon Hayes from Wairo, and Richard Harding from King's College London, for their assistance in developing this plenary, which emphasizes that care and support are integral to comprehensive HIV care. The question may be asked, do we need care and support in the era of antiretroviral treatment? Or the fact that antiretrovirals change HIV from a terminal illness into a chronic illness is enough, and people just need to attend the clinic regularly and they will be fine. Is there sufficient care and support provided at the antiretroviral treatment centers? We believe that care and support are key factors in successful treatment adherence and in prevention programs, as well as responding to the needs of people living with HIV. So what is the experience of a person who is HIV positive? He attends the antiretroviral clinic if he or she is fortunate enough to be on an antiretroviral program. He receives support from the treatment counsellor, care from the HIV clinician and care and support from the ARV clinic nurse. He receives advice from the pharmacist and then he goes home to the family and the community for care and support. Is there sufficient attention to care and support at the HIV clinics? There are a large number of patients, doctors are busy and must focus on how the disease is being controlled. On the CD4 count, the viral load, are patients adhering to the medication? Do they have side effects from their treatment? Is the person who's HIV positive empowered to discuss other problems? Is he asked about pain? Do the doctor and the patient accept pain as part of the illness? Does the doctor anticipate that pain will improve on antiretroviral treatment alone? I ask how long does the patient continue to suffer pain waiting for antiretrovirals to take effect in treating pain, knowing that they are not analgesics? And think about this. What happens when you wake up worrying in the middle of the night? Maybe I'm dying. I'm HIV positive, could I die from this? Could I be dying now? Do you have the courage to bring this up with your doctor? Is the fear of dying discussed or dismissed? No, no, you're on antiretrovirals, you're not going to die. Or is this worry discussed and are you asked for further information? 
antiretrovirals will improve a person's condition. So yes, reassurance is appropriate. But what is really worrying you at the moment? What is it that's waking you up in the middle of the night? When we look at the care needs of people who are HIV positive, they are very complex and they are many, even for those on antiretroviral treatment. In a study done by Richard Harding and his colleagues, they found that there was a significant symptom burden in patients on heart attending outpatient HIV clinics in London. 63% of them complained of tiredness, 55% of worry, 51% still had diarrhea, and 50% complained of pain that was untreated. 47% had various skin problems, 46% numbness and tingling in hands and feet, a sign of peripheral neuropathy, and 32% said yes, they have suicidal ideation. Here again is a slide that indicates that there are a large number of problems requiring care and support. Kim Green put this together, collating published evidence that shows the palliative care needs for people from stage one to stage four HIV for those on antiretroviral treatment. There's a significant symptom burden that requires an attentive palliative care approach. So it's clear that people living with HIV don't just have problems when they attend the antiretroviral clinic. They are living with HIV as a daily, hourly reality. And what about the middle of the night? Who do we ask about our worries? Can our family help? Do they know how to help? Do they know our worries? Are they themselves also worried? And are they tired of hearing my concerns again and again? If they bring up the fact that I still have pain, are they concerned and sympathetic or irritated? Did you ask the doctor? No, we spoke about the medication. Well, I can't help you if you don't tell the doctor. Does the family have enough information and knowledge, enough confidence to provide care? What about my financial concerns? What about transport? Do I, how do I get to the clinic to get my monthly antiretrovirals? Who will care for the children? How can I make sure that they still get to school? How do I put food on the table for the family? There are many more worries than just the attention to the illness itself. So we suggest that people who are HIV positive are referred to home-based care. There they will receive adherence support and referral for treatment, whether for antiretrovirals or for opportunistic, opportunistic infections. Advice on symptom control, nursing care. The caregiver also explains prevention messages to family and provides counselling to address their anxieties and fears. She can advise on planning future care of the person who's ill and care of the family, and if necessary, refers to a professional nurse supervisor, to social services, to legal services. This next slide is very busy, and I think like the Vienna Uban, a little bit complicated until you know how it works, and then it's very efficient. It explains the continuum of care. The community caregiver is in the same block as the patient and the family, the person who's HIV positive and her family. The community caregiver becomes very close to the people they care for, and care is provided in that individual's own home. If the community caregiver is worried, she refers to the professional nurse. The professional nurse will also visit at home, and the counsellor may visit at home. And behind this team is an interdisciplinary team at the clinic or the hospice. And the doctor may be consulted to assess and treat pain or other distressing symptoms. The professional counsellor 
may be required to manage more complex psychosocial or spiritual problems. And if necessary, the HIV positive person will be admitted to the hospice inpatient unit or to the hospital and there may get the attention to more significant problems. The foundation to this program is education and support at every level. The doctor requiring training in palliative care and pain management, the community caregiver in home-based palliative care. And there's a strong inter-referral system and supportive services between the hospital, clinic, hospice, home-based care program. And this support enhances that continuum of care. And there are many effective models of community-based care that promote this continuum. Because I think it is clear that a once-a-month visit to the clinic is not sufficient to provide ongoing care and support. Home-based palliative care, and in every home-based care program, carers should be trained in palliative care, because in any service there will be people who have distressing symptoms or severe psychosocial and spiritual problems. Home-based palliative care provides comprehensive care. The community caregivers are trained to screen for clinical problems and to refer to a professional nurse if necessary. They are trained in basic nursing skills, pressure care, mouth care, care of the bowels, in providing nutritional advice. They're trained in treatment support for antiretroviral treatment, for TB treatment, for analgesic medication. They have basic counseling skills, including bereavement counseling. And they themselves may need, as some of their clients may die, and the community caregivers have become very close to the person that they have cared for. And enhancing this care that the community caregivers provide is the supervision and support provided by the professional nurse. What about access to medication? As this is one of the barriers to effective home-based care. There are legal barriers to be addressed. Who is licensed to prescribe medication? Is there access to opioid medication in your country? Medication that is essential for good pain control. Care organizations worldwide state unequivocally that palliative care and pain management is a basic human right. So are palliative care medicines on the essential medicines list in your country? And how do homebound patients actually access medication that may be held in the clinic or hospital? What are the regulations and the logistics of getting medication from the clinic or hospital pharmacy to the person at home? If we turn now and ask who is currently providing care and support services, is it provided on, at the HIV clinic on a once a month basis? Yes, hospices are steeped in care and support principles. But many clinicians and patients view hospices as providing only terminal care. And the role of hospices in the restoration to health of people who are HIV positive is not well known. We can empower hospitals to provide care and support, but in actual fact, most of the care and support is provided in the community. In South Africa, 98% of the care provided by hospices is provided in the individual's own home. Home-based care is provided informally by family members or by neighbors or it may be provided by trained community caregivers working with a home-based care organization. However, NGOs are outside of the formal healthcare system, and there's not strong recognition of the value of home-based care. The carers themselves are usually women, often children 
or older person and their not sufficient acknowledgement and recognition of the importance of their work and the contribution towards strengthening a country's health system. The family and community caregivers, and here we have photographs of a child caring for a family member at home and a granny who now is looking after these orphaned grandchildren. So the caregivers are usually women, often very young, often old, and they are anchoring a critical response to HIV and the cooperation between the formal healthcare system and community support is crucial. I'd also like to speak a little bit about the program that in South Africa we have initiated in the prisons, having this very emotive talk earlier, that we have a memorandum of understanding with our Department of Correctional Services and are training the health staff in the prisons to provide care and support to offenders who may be ill and it is proving to improve the access to treatment of offenders and compassionate care for people who are ill and who are in the prisons. Why is there neglect of care and support issues? Is it because of competing priorities? Yes, there is an urgency of prevention and the fact that prevention is essential to control this epidemic. There's a strong focus on treatment and advocacy for antiretroviral treatment and access to treatment itself is a strong component of care and support programs. However, there is a problem that there's a lack of integration of services. And why this lack of integration of prevention, treatment and care and support? There are misconceptions regarding care, some of which I have discussed, but basically care is undervalued and people who are ill do not have the energy or the means to be powerful advocates for the care and support that they need. There are gender issues in that care is seen as women's work, something women do as part of their daily lives, their work is taken for granted, undervalued and usually unpaid and the caregivers are disempowered and not able to take their place in decision making about the care they receive and their work circumstances. There are also misconceptions regarding palliative care. A lot of people seeing palliative care as only care of the dying and I re-emphasize the role of palliative care in the restoration to health of a person who's HIV positive. In fact, palliative care is applicable early in the course of the illness in conjunction with treatments such as antiretroviral treatment that is intended to prolong life. Palliative care affirms life and focuses on quality of life. Palliative care addresses each person's individual needs, whether those are physical, psychological, social, or spiritual needs. And palliative care provides holistic, person-centered care. If we look now at a report that came from the WHO and VSO Regional AIDS Initiative in Southern Africa, this report on scaling up HIV prevention, treatment, care and support in community and home-based care programs, and in reducing the burden of HIV and AIDS care on carers in the Southern African development community. You can see that the report demonstrates that the services provided by home-based carers are varied and skilled and cross the spectrum of prevention, treatment, care and support. There is strong evidence that shows many positive outcomes of care and support for people who are HIV positive and for their families. These include enhanced understanding of HIV, improved health and well-being, fewer distressing symptoms, more rapid response to intercurrent infections and other problems, and there's better adherence when support is provided in the home, looking at this photograph of a community carer and her client, and you can see how strong that supportive relationship is in this photograph. 
also better support to the family, a reduction in loss to follow-up cases, fewer deaths, a reduction in reported depression, and a number of programs provide skills building programs and income generating activities resulting in economic empowerment. There's a reduction in stigma and discrimination and improved self-esteem for the person living with HIV. This photograph needs little explanation. You can see how desperately ill this young girl is. She's eight years old, she's orphaned, she's HIV positive, now with TB meningitis, and she has been referred to a children's home from the hospital for terminal care. It's clear that she's dying. So can you believe that this is Zinfle six months after admission? where she was seen by a palliative care paediatrician. Her TB meningitis was treated. She's now on heart. She has been placed in her grandmother's home with a child care grant. So a child care grant to help her in, um, with some financial assistance. She's been referred to a home-based care organization and she's actually gained 20 kilograms in six months. So let us turn now to the community caregiver. What are his or her needs? They include pre-service and in-service training, support and supervision from the professional staff and acknowledgement of the value of her work and her status in the community. She also needs social protection mechanisms and employment benefits in place. And it's very important that she has a strong care for the caregiver program because our community caregivers need to deal with with strong responsibilities and experience emotional distress that may be part of their work. Most community caregivers report that they find their work fulfilling and that they do have a recognised status in the community. We need to encourage men's involvement at carers and to empower the women as decision makers in the work that they do and in home-based care policies. How do we ensure caregiver support and recognition? We ask that governments healthcare planners and donors recognize the committed and compassionate community response to providing integrated care and support to people living with HIV. We ask that this community-based care and support is acknowledged as an integral part of HIV care, that it is valued and funded. So the recommendations promoted by the Caregivers Action Network, home-based care and palliative care organisations worldwide are that there should be comprehensive national policies on HIV care and support. Good standards of care for people who are HIV positive. Recognition of the role of community caregivers and appropriate standards of support for those caregivers provision of the necessary equipment, including home-based care kits and medicines, fair financial support for the work that they are doing, ongoing training, support and supervision, and inclusion of the caregivers as decision makers. During this conference, integration of services has been a recurring theme, and this must include integration of care and support services which do we need to be reminded is one of the three pillars of universal access. So in conclusion, we would like to emphasize that people living with and affected by HIV have a right to quality, integrated care and support right here, right now.
morning, everybody. My name is Ricardo Diaz from Sao Paulo, Brazil. I'm here to introduce next speaker, David Thomas. David Thomas is Chief of Infectious Disease and the Stanhope Bain Jones Professor of Medicine at John Hopkins uh, School of Medicine. Dr. Thomas is training in internal medicine and infectious disease and cares for patients with infectious disease, including chronic viral hepatitis. He also oversees clinical research projects focused on understanding the natural history and pathogenesis of HCV infection. He is the PI of numerous NIH grants, the author or co-author of over 150 peer-reviewed publications and holds in U.S. patent. Dr. Thomas serves on numerous editorial and advisory boards. Uh, for the next presentation entitled Hepatitis C, Cure and Control, right now, please welcome Dave Thomas. Thank you very much. On, on behalf of my co-authors, Drs. Kumar, Sabrinsky, and Litsakis, I'd like to thank you for the privilege of speaking uh, to you this morning about hepatitis C. You know, hepatitis C is the right topic for a meeting focused on persons living with HIV because hepatitis C has emerged as one of the leading causes of death. And right now is the right time to talk about hepatitis C because we're literally on the precipice, precipice of a new era of hepatitis C treatment that's going to transform our ability to cure infected patients. And this meeting, with its emphasis on human rights, is interestingly the exact right venue to give this presentation because these new treatments are, proje are projected to create vast inequities in hepatitis C outcomes because of differences in their distribution. So hepatitis C is the right topic, this is the right time, and I think this is the right meeting to discuss hepatitis C. Now of all the things that I could say about hepatitis C, I'm going to show you evidence to defend a very simple message, that for persons living with HIV, hepatitis C is a major public health challenge that can and should be controlled. So on the one hand, we have a serious condition that on the other hand, there's clear evidence can be controlled. Let's begin with the challenge. Hepatitis C is a challenge for two major reasons. One, it's common, and secondly, it's medically severe. You're already familiar with these WHO projections of persons living with HIV. Interestingly, in North America, here in Europe and throughout Asia, about one out of three of these HIV-infected persons also has hepatitis C, is hepatitis C co-infected. But this summary statistic masks the real reality of hepatitis C co-infection that differs markedly according to how HIV was acquired. Whether you're in Baltimore, in Australia, or here in Europe, hepatitis C infection occurs in 70 to up to 100 percent of persons who acquired HIV from injection drug use. Likewise, throughout Asia, there's clear evidence that hepatitis C infection is the rule in HIV-infected injection drug users. There aren't as many data from some places in Eastern Europe, and I wish I could share them with you, pointing actually to the to the lack of uh, effective screening and testing in those regions. In contrast to these enormous, uh, enormous burden of hepatitis C that is evident in injection drug users with HIV, fewer than 15% of persons who have acquired HIV from intercourse will have hepatitis C co-infection. This linkage between injection drug use and hepatitis C, of course, explains what you've already seen, uh, the burden of hepatitis C in HIV-infected persons in prisons. It also explains the linkage uh, between hepatitis C and HIV among persons with hemophilia. And it explains why for every one co-infected person 
uh, with uh, inject and drug user, with hepatitis C and HIV. There are several others with just hepatitis C but not HIV. An important exception to these trends is that recently there have been very well described outbreaks of hepatitis C among HIV infected MSM populations linked to recreational drug use and very high risk sexual practices. So hepatitis C is common in HIV infected individuals and hepatitis C is also medically important because HIV makes all the stages in the course of hepatitis C worse, beginning with the likelihood of developing persistent infection. Roughly 60% of persons who acquire hepatitis C go on and have chronic hepatitis. But if you consider HIV-infected individuals, such as in this cohort of Baltimore injection drug users, and you look at the risk of having persistent infection after testing more than a thousand antibody positive injection drug users for evidence of the virus in their blood, you see that the risk compared to HIV negative persons with hepatitis C antibodies, the risk of persistent infection is markedly elevated, at least twofold higher in persons co infected with HIV. And among those who develop persistent infection, the abundance of the virus in the blood, that is, the hepatitis C viral load, is also higher if the person is co-infected with HIV. The same, in the same cohort, the viral loads uh, shown here on the x-axis being higher on the right and lower on the left. Notice that the HIV co-infected subset, shown in the red, has, tends to have higher hepatitis C viral loads compared to the HIV negative group that has a greater proportion of low viral loads. So more viral persistence among those with persistent infection, a higher abundance of the virus in their blood and liver, and among those that are fortunate enough to get into treatment, a lower treatment response. Co-infected persons with the same hepatitis C genotype or clade, if you will, who receive hepatitis C treatment for the same length of time with the same medicines have half the treatment outcome as HIV negative controls. So more viral persistence, higher viral load, less likely to respond to treatment, and those that don't respond to treatment or don't get treatment have an increased risk of developing cirrhosis or the clinical manifestation of cirrhosis, end-stage liver failure, or liver cancer. These are data from the multicenter hemophilia cohort study in which 1,816 individuals were followed. And you can see that the risk of liver failure, clinical liver failure, was higher in HIV positive individuals than individuals who were similar with regard to hepatitis C but HIV negative. You also see from this, these data by the dominance of non-hepatic deaths that these data chiefly were accumulated before antiretroviral therapy was available. And so they raised the question, the very important question of if on the one hand HIV makes all of this worse, increasing viral persistence, increasing the viral load, increasing the risk of cirrhosis and liver failure, then what about heart? Does heart change that risk. There are some data that uh, remain controversial that suggest that antiretroviral therapy might in fact reduce the risk of liver failure, reduce, reduce the risk of progression of liver disease, but this remains controversial and the effect of heart on this outcome cannot be very significant based on available data. What is crystal clear from all the data that have been published is that antiretroviral therapy is not enough. Antiretroviral therapy is not sufficient to reduce the hep C viral load. In fact, it increases it. It's not sufficient to restore normal interferon treatment responses, and it's not sufficient to prevent cirrhosis or liver failure. In fact, when we followed individuals that were duly infected and done serial liver biopsies on those individuals, 
24% of 171 individuals had significant progression over just 2.9 years, even though half of them had full and effective viral suppression during the entire time. And more importantly, there was no difference in significant liver progression among those with suppression of viremia compared to those who were not even taking antiretroviral therapy. So antiretroviral therapy is not sufficient to decrease and to take away these important uh, co-infection outcomes. Of course, what antiretroviral therapy does, I don't need to explain to this audience, is it markedly improves mortality. In these data, following almost 4,000 individuals in Denmark, marked improvements, marked reductions in mortality were seen in both men and women in association with the use of antiretroviral therapy. And of course, this is not news to any of you here. What's interesting uh, from these data is that even if you look amongst persons who have been taking antiretroviral therapy and followed in the era of heart, whereas you can see that their mortality expectations are beginning to ex approximate the general population shown in blue, these are the HIV infected, these are those in blue, mortality expectations beginning to look like persons without HIV, a very different story emerges if you include those who are co-infected with hepatitis C. I'm only showing you those with HIV alone. If you look at mortality rates in the same study conducted the same way in persons who are co-infected, you see markedly different outcomes and essentially no effect of heart. So here we have probably one of the most remarkable breakthroughs in the history of medicine, at least in my time, that's markedly reducing mortality in HIV-infected HIV individuals, and yet having an almost no effect in this subset that's duly infected, creating gross inequities in medical outcomes in HIV-infected individuals. So far, I'm only talking about statistics, and Dimitri, my co-author Dennis, and Christopher would, of course, tell you that there's much more to this story than the statistics, and often medical providers underestimate the importance of stigma, some of the neuropsychiatric complications, and the compounding issues of dealing so with psychologically and economically with yet another chronic condition. So no matter how you look at it, Co-infection is an extraordinarily important uh, aspect of HIV and an important public health challenge. Well, fortunately, there's also very good evidence that this challenge can be controlled. The first step in controlling any infectious disease, of course, is preventing it, and there's evidence that you can prevent hepatitis C infection. Of course, hepatitis C infection can be eliminated by from transfusions simply by screening the donations. And hepatitis C transmission in healthcare settings can be eliminated by observance of universal precautions. Likewise, hepatitis C can be prevented among injection drug users. In that same injection drug user cohort from Baltimore, there have been serial reductions in the incidence of hepatitis C and HIV in each of the enrollments over the last decade in association with the harm reduction measures such as needle exchange that are taking place. So hepatitis C infection can clearly be prevented. But there's 170 million people that already have hepatitis C, so it's also important that hepatitis C can be controlled once you have infection. The first step here, of course, is recognizing infection by testing and, and then counseling individuals to reduce further harm to themselves or spread to other individuals. Probably the most potent form of control is eradication of treatment, eradication of infection by treatment. When hepatitis C treatment is given, the virus can be eliminated from the blood and the liver and when you stop treatment, it doesn't come back. That is con 
considered a sustained virologic response or quite simply a cure. There's clear evidence that sustained virologic responses can be achieved even in persons co-infected with HIV, albeit at a lower rate than if they didn't have HIV. There's also clear evidence that co-infected individuals sustain their sustained virologic responses. Soriano and co-workers followed 77 individuals after a sustained virologic response for more than 4,000 months and there were no relapses and there have been many other studies showing similar outcomes. So sustained virologic response is possible, sustained virologic response is sustained, and sustained virologic response matters. These data from Spain examine uh, the long-term clinical outcomes shown here are actual mortality rates in 493 individuals who received treatment but did not get a sustained virologic response compared to 218 with a sustained virologic response. And as you can see, sustained virologic response lowers the likelihood of liver failure and lowers the likelihood of dying. So it, ma it can be achieved, it can be sustained, and it matters. And fortunately, sustained virologic responses are going to become more likely. There is a new era of hepatitis C treatment at hand. Drugs that interfere with all the different steps of the hepatitis C life cycle are being developed, just as with HIV. Hepatitis C heart, if you will, is at hand. And if you look at how one of these compounds, a protease inhibitor called telapavir, affects the, the sustained virologic response rates, you can see that when you treat someone for 48 weeks with pegylated interferon and ribavirin, this is the standard of care. If you compare this outcome to an individual receiving pegylated interferon and ribavirin now for only 24 weeks, half as long, but for the first 12 weeks taking this protease inhibitor, you've had a 20% improvement in these published phase 2b outcomes. These same two arms and data that have been released but not published, the sustained virologic response rate went from 44% up to 75%. 75% of individuals cured with 24 weeks of treatment. Of course, these are in HIV uninfected individuals but studies are underway in co-infected individuals and there's no reason we won't see similar improvements in outcomes. And this, of course, is just the beginning. This is the protease inhibitor class. This is one candidate, but there are drugs being developed that are potent inhibitors of hepatitis C in all of the classes. And there are even studies ongoing right now to test the hypothesis that you can get rid of the interferon, get rid of the injection, get rid of many of the side effects uh, and treat hepatitis C for short periods of time uh, with orally active medications. Nobody knows the outcome of these individual studies, but there's fairly clear evidence right now that we're moving into a new time for the treatment of hepatitis C. We're moving into an exciting period where cure is going to be possible with much less treatment, with much less side effects, and with much less time. But interestingly, the theme of this topic is not someday for some people, but for all people right now. And so I have to finish by coming back to the present. I've said that hepatitis C infection can be prevented, but the other side of that is that in many places in the world, there aren't resources to screen blood donations and there aren't resources or even the right educational systems in place to have universal precautions. And interestingly, hepatitis C continues to be spread by medical exposures and that's the dominant form of hepatitis C transmission worldwide, despite the fact that it's completely preventable. Hepatitis C can be transmission can be prevented by harm reduction measures, but even in places where harm reduction measures are in place, and there are few, hepatitis C infection continues. 
Hep C is an order of magnitude more transmissible than HIV, and so the measures that you use to control HIV are not going to be enough to stop Hep C transmission. It needs to be intensified. I've said that hepatitis C can be cured, but today's present reality is much more sobering. This is the reality from my own institution. In between two, 1999 and 2003, a treatment clinic was set up for hepatitis C. 845 co-infected people walked through the HIV treatment door. 277 came for evaluation of hepatitis C. 185 kept their appointment. 125 had a pretreatment evaluation consisting of a biopsy and a viral load and genotype. 69 had, didn't have a treatment, in, uh, were, were eligible for treatment, 29 received treatment, and six were cured. We're doing better than that, fortunately, right now. But still, in most places, uh, the overall cure rates among co-infected individuals is less than 10%. And I'm talking about places where HIV testing and hep C testing is occurring. These are people coming into care. You've just heard from Dimitri that this is the exception. Most places uh, in the world, there isn't even access to treatment. A simple diagnostic test that's very accurate is not available. Even in the United States, we actually estimate that 70% of the individuals with hepatitis C don't even know they have it. They haven't been tested yet. They're in prisons, they're in methadone treatment or not and they don't know they have hepatitis C. And of course, what are, the, what are these data, what, are these, what does this exciting news have to say uh, when it costs 20,000 euro uh, to be treated? What does that have to do with a co-infected drug user uh, in Chennai, or in Karachi, or in a Ukrainian prison? So to be clear, I'm saying that there's something very exciting at hand. I'm saying that we have treatments coming that are going to make it increasingly possible to cure hepatitis C infection. And I think there will come a day when we can cure nearly everyone that we're able to get into care. But I'm also saying something different. I'm also saying that right now, with the way things are going worldwide, if you take a global perspective, and you consider that fewer than 10% of the 170 million hepatitis C infected individuals are actually engaged in care. And you project this out to a situation where you're curing everyone in care. So you're curing everyone in care, but you're only treating 10%. At a population level, you've achieved very little. And unfortunately, this is the most likely outcome given the realities that we have today our ability to cure nearly everyone in care, but very few people receiving testing, very few people receiving treatment. Well, the way forward, um, at least the objectives are fairly clear. Obviously, we need to make it possible to observe universal precautions and screen blood donations around the world. We need to intensify harm reduction efforts we need to expand access to testing, and that becomes especially important when it's coupled with treatment, being able to do something about the outcome of the test. The way forward is clear. How we get there, I think, is very challenging. This meeting began with the recognition that with HIV, we have exciting medications that can save people, that can uh, take a child like we just saw literally back from the grave. And that's something that we should all applaud for and something that's uh, actually an, an astonishing event uh, in medicine. But just as with HIV, we need to be able to get those exciting new treatments out to everyone who needs them. So it is with hepatitis C, and I'd like to end at least the plenary sessions, on that same note, we need to figure out a way to take hepatitis C care and bring it to the people who need it and to integrate hepatitis C treatment into what we're doing for HIV. 
beginning here and, yes, beginning right now. I'd like to thank uh, my co-authors uh, for their contributions uh, to my lecture uh, and to uh, the ALIVE cohort and its leadership uh, and funding from the National Institutes of Health for um, the slides that I showed. And, and especially I'd like to thank all of you for staying uh, for my lecture. So thank you very much. I think we're done. Thank you for coming. <laughs>